Hey everybody, welcome into Redacted on this Thursday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And we have a busy show for you on this Thursday. I feel like we've been vindicated now because for those that were really in support of the Biden administration and, you know, the Biden's lies about the bridge collapse and what's been going on there, we now have some stunning new information from the NTSB this afternoon. We're going to explain that to you and what happened with the black box on the bridge. Plus, we're also going to talk about great replacement and the next state in the United States for Biden's invasion is happening right now. The Department of Homeland Security sending out letters to the mayors of a particular state, and we will tell you where that state is and where you can expect an influx of illegal immigrants in the United States. Plus, we're coming up on Easter weekend. The king is missing. We're not talking about Elvis. David asked before the break, which or king? Me. Yeah. Not you, darling, not Elvis, the King okay. of England we haven't seen in a while. So is this part of a larger conspiracy around the princess and the king? Are we making too much of it? You let us know because, or is just the palace really terrible at telling us truths? I think that's the case. Maybe they have something in, in common with the Biden administration. By the way, I don't know if you can hear this, but we are literally in the middle of like a gale right now. So yeah, we're going to have some fun tonight. I don't know if you like crazy rain and windstorm. It's like, can you hear that? Yeah, just right on cue. It's not a weather machine. It is actual weather. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, yeah. So also we're going to talk about war rhetoric in Kosovo on the 25th anniversary of the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. So that's fun. Yeah, that's fun. And Serbians, of course, are furious about this. Yes. Could could Kosovo become the next Ukraine? So we've got a lot to talk about today on the show. But glad to see all of you guys here. Welcome in. We are live Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you guys so much for subscribing and being part of our show here. We really, really appreciate it. Let us know where you're joining us from around the world. Um, yeah, we're trying to we're working on having Laura Logan on the show. Um, she's been traveling right now. So hopefully on Monday, uh, we're trying to get her on the show to talk more about you know, what her sources are telling her as it relates to this bridge collapse um, in Baltimore. So hopefully Laura will be joining us on Monday. We're excited about that. Um, and we also have some big interviews coming up this weekend, which you will get a chance to see as well. Um, so again, we'll talk about that. Well, let's just get into it tonight. we got a lot to get to on this Thursday night. The Department of Homeland Security has selected its next state as the next resettlement state for illegal immigrants. That's right, Tennessee is the state, guys. Tennessee. Biden's great replacement plan is unfolding exactly as planned. The Department of Homeland Security has sent letters to the mayors of Tennessee cities, letting them know to get ready and get prepared. Illegal immigrants will be resettled in Tennessee. Watch. Most of them coming from Guatemala, Venezuela, Honduras, and Mexico. It's very troubling that you know someone can come to this country, name Nashville or Greater Nashville as the destination, and we're not finding out about it uh, for months later. U.S. Congressman Andy Ogles telling Fox 17 News that he had a conference call with DHS yesterday with a series of questions, including a request for updated numbers, how people will be tracked, and if they have prior convictions. They didn't have uh, any good answers. The notice says DHS may release non-citizens from custody who have been fully screened and vetted pending the outcome of their immigration process. They'll also have check-ins with ICE. Going through the process correctly would mean applying for some sort of a visa. And so coming across uh, the border and wanting to be processed and claiming asylum uh, is, uh, we've clearly hit the threshold, but we can't allow that anymore. So they'll do check-ins with ICE, right? As we know from J.J. Carroll's book, Invaded, these check-ins are required and they're laughable. I mean, ICE, of course, under the Department of Homeland Security, they're overwhelmed. They're supposed to check in voluntarily and come and check in with them and then await some sort of a court date later on. Well, and what they're not telling us is what the wait times are for those court dates by some measures in certain government agencies. It's up to six years. So what do they do in the meantime? The, uh, yeah, the asylum judges, basically six years. That's a minimum. Even JJ writes about this. He says, like, that's, he thinks that number is well higher than six years. Sure. They're so overwhelmed. Uh, six years? So what happens is they get asylum. They're then in the United States. And what the Biden administration has done has allowed them to come in instead of going to ports of entry and wait to come in. No, no, they're allowed, the Biden administration is allowing them to come in and set up shop inside of the United States. Normally, okay. they would have to go to a point of port of entry and be turned away and await their court date before they can have this meeting. Go ahead, David. I was gonna say, how else are they gonna turn Tennessee blue? 
You know, well, like, exactly. That's oh, you're the point. you're one step ahead of me here. Oh. Uh, so they come in, they tell the border patrol, send me to Tennessee. And I love that they get to tell them they're given an iPhone, they're given free food, they're given money, and they're given an iPhone. And they can tell them, they can tell them where they want to go in the United States. They can tell Customs and Border Patrol, uh, yeah, I'd like to go to Tennessee. I, wouldn't that be nice? You could just free travel wherever you want to go across the United States. They plan, of course, to resettle these areas, making them Democrat voters. See, David was psychically already predicting where this is going in key districts here. So again, all you need is a few thousand people in each district to swing an election. President Donald Trump won Tennessee, right? So that's a great city. That's a great uh, area to target for Democrats to turn Tennessee blue. Um, all you need is a few thousand people. And look at these districts. Here's where you need to turn a few of these cities. They're already doing it in Nashville. They need Knoxville. They need Chattanooga. And they need these other areas now and these other districts where there are very few people would sway a district in one particular direction or another. It's all you need, just a few thousand people scattered here and there strategically. Brilliant move. Illegal alien influencer. Can you imagine that? Like you're an influencer, uh, you know, like, I don't know, we're a news influencer. I don't know. But imagine being an illegal alien influencer, which is what this guy is. Uh, he thanks Daddy Biden for all of this. En Estados Unidos, mira qué belleza. Feliz y contento porque a los venezolanos le está yendo bien, porque las fronteras están abiertas 24/7. Muchachos, tienen que sacar malas noticias para sentirse feliz y contento. No, las cosas no son así. ¿Sí me entienden? Y bueno, yo como ya voy a tener mi nacionalidad porque mi papá Biden está activo 24/7. Mira. Yeah, daddy. Okay. Daddy Biden. Why don't you have a shirt? then he doesn't need a shirt he's, so well. he's warm he's hot um so he's also by the way the same guy that uh, let everyone know around the world how to squat in people's homes you'll recall that video from last week and which has gone viral here come into these homes in the united states and squat in these particular homes and because of squatters laws you will have a right to those properties and it's almost impossible for them to kick you out only because that went viral now he says he's getting threats and he had to change the name of his channel yeah he switched he, he was crying about his channel got taken down and then he now started a new channel yeah um i loved a response though on social media it was like hey if you're going to illegally squat in people's homes, here's the key. Go to the yard, and if you see a Biden Kamala Harris yard sign, that's the home you want to go to. <laughs> Do it there. Do it there. Do They're it okay those, with yeah. it. They're okay with that. I'm sure they'd welcome you in with open arms, by the way. So, because the you know those lawn signs that people put out, you know, we believe in this house, love is love. We believe no person is illegal. So that so should that's, be that's the sign. Yeah, yeah that so should be a them, sign. Yeah. Go to those they, liberal they homes. They are saying so. Yeah, they're so saying. So go ahead. Go there. Yeah. Knock on their door or don't or when they're not home. Do whatever you're going to do, I guess. Well, you should do it while they're home. Just walk on in. Yeah. <laughs> See how they respond to that. Just It's just like the sanctuary cities, right? Where these cities, of course, we're, we're a sanctuary city. Come to our city until you can't. Like Mayor Eric Adams, of course, who was just totally overwhelmed by this. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, of course, the, the mayor of uh, Denver, Colorado, who then started sending illegal immigrants out of Denver, Colorado, because they couldn't handle it. So Yale, MIT, just conducted a study that says it's 22 million, not 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. 22 million. Now, doing some quick math. Now, that, that's double. By the way, this study is from 2018. Oh, okay. So now, this study is from 2018 when we were hearing there was 11 million here. The numbers are close to 50 million. 50 million. So that study from 2018, six years ago. Liberals, of course, on MSNBC will tell you that this is not happening and there's no great replacement plan at all. Of course, they're lying to you. And Biden told us right to our faces exactly what the plan was years ago, just like they told you how they would, blow, you know, how they were going to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. Here was Biden telling us the plan. An unrelenting stream of immigration, nonstop, nonstop. Folks like me who were Caucasian of European descent, for the first time in 2017, we'll be in an absolute minority in the United States of America. Absolute minority. Fewer than 50% of the people in America from then and on 
will be white European stock. That's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a source of our strength. A source of our strength. Right. It's not, and it's not about diversity. And I don't think there's, I think most Americans are not racist at all. I think we welcome all Americans of all different, all different colors of skin. Right. But it's when you have an invasion from countries that don't stare, share your values, don't speak your language, uh, don't share your customs, don't share your community customs where you, you know, to criminality. You know, this is not something we tolerate in our communities. That's where we put our foot down. Right. Kind of like Ukraine. What do you mean? I mean, like the, our, the values. The, we, we support their values, but their values are, they're like one of the most corrupt, it was a joke. Oh, the I see most what you're saying. Countries in the, I got it. I had world. to. I had to stretch. I had to stretch for your <laughs> joke there, but sorry. But I mean, you think about it, right? It's not about the color. It's not about the color of the skin. It's not about whether you're Asian or black. It's about the fact that you're literally from another country and you don't even speak the language and you don't share our customs and our social mores and you come in and basically destroy a community. And who should get a vote into what that community then is? And so we see how the Democratic Party has courted black voters and then how they treat them, right? You can live in squalor. You can have people on drugs in your neighborhood with guns and drugs and violence. We don't care. We won't arrest you because we think that's racist. So you go ahead and live just like that. That's fine. Vote Democratic. So, you know, any kind of Latins who are immigrating into the United States and, th and by this Democrats are for immigrants are going to find out in short order one or two generations later how that is absolutely not true. Right. And as J.J. Carroll points out in his book, also, he points out that there are when these immigrants, illegal immigrants have come into the country and they've been there for, I don't know, 10 years they find out, wow, that they've actually lost their job to other illegal immigrants. That the that this idea of finding prosperity is also being hindered by the very same people that they are that they were years years ago, coming in illegally. So those very same people, Americans, are losing their jobs to illegal immigrants, and even illegal immigrants who've been here for five six years and have these jobs are losing their jobs to illegal immigrants. So the very same people are taking those jobs away. So whites will be an absolute minority. That's the source of our strength, he says. The best example of this plan is now unfolding in Michigan, by the way, where they just rolled out their plan for illegal resettlement. This is the, the state of Michigan just rolled out their plan for illegal resettlement. The state of Michigan has a new program called the Newcomer Rental Subsidy Program that you can read about right on their website. Just go to michigan.gov and you can read all about it and you can even file your application. It's called the Refugees and Newcomer Population Eligible Households. You'll get $500 per month for up to 12 months with eligibility based on immigration status and household income. Here are all the different formats you can do if you're Ukrainian, Spanish, uh, Pashto, um, if you're Haitian, Arabic, all of that is right there. If you're an asyl asylum, asylee or a refugee, you get status. Um, Afghan nationals, victims of human trafficking, all of that. Under 80, you have to match these guidelines under 85% of federal, federal poverty limit. So you can't have any money at all, basically. You can't qualify if you have any kind of savings is basi you know, basically what happens. If you're Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, Venezuelan, um, come on right in. So Rachel Maddow, we're not making so... We're not making this up. The state of Michigan will use Michigan tax dollars to resettle illegal immigrants into Michigan rental properties. And I know that MSNBC likes to say that this is all fakery. Rachel Maddow says that you're just being a xenophobe. This is happening. Um, and you, I mean, have you seen a clearer example of replacement theory in action? We will bring you in and pay for your housing. We'll pay for your housing in these communities on top of that. So, so because because I'm I'm uh, uh, in in the near future planning a, uh, a move to Michigan. So if I just go on a huge spending spree, like kill off my savings, they'll move me there for free, or is it just because because yeah, I'm no, I speak? No, no, because you're an American mm. citizen, so you don't get access to this Damn. this free housing program. You have to be an well, illegal. Nice. You have to be an illegal. But immigrant. if you flew down through Baja and then came back around up through Mexico, possibly, and pretend you have no ID. Yeah, pretend yeah. you have no idea and claim that you are here on asylum. Maybe that's how you could get free housing in Michigan. So you wouldn't yeah. have to pay for it. But as an American citizen, you'll have to pay for it. Well, Philip maybe can pass for Latin. He doesn't let us see his face. So we don't know. We have we don't Costa know. Rican descent. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. No one's yeah. actually seen his face, so possibly he could pass. Yeah. So, but sadly, as an American citizen, you don't get access to this program here. So, unfortunately, uh, why is this happening? Well, Michigan is losing workers and population thanks to lack of jobs and high crime. It's been happening for years in Michigan. Can Michigan defuse its population time bomb? See how far we fall short is the headline. Um, and demographers and economists have been raising the alarm about Michigan's population time bomb for years. Michigan is short of workers everywhere, from its schools and hospitals to local Coney Island. It faces up an uphill battle to attract new businesses from out of state because of labor uncertainty. Fewer workers leads to diminished tax revenue, which leaves less money to preserve parks, protect residents, and fix potholes. The average resident driving on those roads is older, sicker, and poorer than a decade ago. So while Michigan is starting to slightly turn this around, actually, their numbers are slowly climbing back up. Why? Thanks to illegal immigrants. Michigan's population inches up as deaths and immigration climb, as death falls and immigration climbs. Of course, COVID related, uh, that's the issue. And now those have been fallen off. And now we have immigration climbing in Michigan, thanks to the resettlement opportunities there. So they're excited about this. Those losses were offset this year by a spike in immigration as 22,000 people moved to Michigan. That's the most since 2018. We cannot address our population issues without immigration, says Steve Tobokaman, executive director of Global Detroit, a nonprofit that advocates for immigration as an economic growth strategy. But what if they're not actually doing anything to increase the tax base? They're not doing anything but taking money from the tax base. How is that sustainable? But I guess in, under the Biden administration, that doesn't matter. We can continue to print as much money as possible and keep taking from it, but not replenishing it with any sort of, I, I don't know, growth. So the resettlement plan is working. But of course, ignore all the crime. This is Michigan. This happened on Friday. A woman shot in the head. This was on Friday. She was shot in the head. Her car stolen by an illegal immigrant. Here he is, 25-year-old illegal immigrant from Mexico. And AOC and Bernie Sanders look to take things one step further and make sure that housing is available to anyone. They're rolling out the Green New Deal for housing, they just announced, and they made the announcement in front of the Capitol. It is a beautiful, sunny day in March, cold. and it's a little cold, a little chilly, but... We are here because we are reintroducing the Green New Deal for public housing today. Yeah, yeah nothing to see here. Yay. No problems here, right? So here's what AOC, she goes into some details about it here. Take a look um, um, about some of the little nuggets that are in this Green New Deal for housing. We have to return to an era of rebuilding public housing in the United States. A different world is not only possible, a different world is arriving today. That's right. The Green New Deal for public housing would immediately replenish the multi-billion dollar backlog for public housing repair, repairs. It would repeal the Fair Cloth Amendment. It would invest up to $234 billion over 10 years to preserve, upgrade, and expand our public housing stock. It would bring public housing down to zero carbon emissions while creating 280,000 jobs in America. Yeah. It would end the era of government neglect, demolition, and privatization of our public housing stock. This Ooh. bill also addresses unsustainable rent prices. Yeah. Okay. So the United States government has done an amazing job with public housing over the years, right? So much, you know, we call them the projects, right? Go to Cabrini Green and think about how many people have been sort of segregated into these like crime ridden public housing projects that are a disaster for communities. Um, and it's been the reason they started to privatize it is because it was a disaster. Yes. Right. And he, as Ronald Reagan said, anytime the government says, you know, the, well, the famous words, I'm with the government and I'm here to help. Right. They are not good What's at housing. Litter? It's literally like the ghettos, you know, of old in the, what was it, the 30s or whatever, or 20s, the, the ghettos in, uh, uh, in the Jewish Italy ghettos? Oh, in, po Jewish in ghetto Poland? Ghettos and all those, yeah, Poland. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you think about any service, right, let's think about you go down to a government service to, oh, change your last name on your social security because you get married. 
that's an arduous process, I've done it. Or you're going to get a driver's license or anything that's run by the government and your initial reaction is, ugh, I'm gonna have to go down to a government office and it's not going to be efficient. And then think about any other private service that you go and you will automatically know that you're gonna have a better experience no matter what because private business is more incentivized to have customer service, to make it an easy experience, to make something efficient. The government never is. Never. No, it never is. And when you start to read the, prime, the fine print on the HUD's guidelines here under this Green New Deal, and we still don't have all of the pieces of this, but if you look at the HUD guidelines, non-eligibility or uh, eligibility for non-citizens is right there. Most non-citizens with permanent status are eligible for assistance, which means AOC, Bernie Sanders, Green New Deal for housing, very likely depends on how this all shakes out and actually gets passed by the Biden administration, but he spoke about it during the State of the Union address. He wants this. How will this unfold? This will very likely, with these asylum, uh, the, the asylum program and the, pro, the parolees that are, that are running rampant in the United States under the Biden administration, they will get free public housing under the uh, AOC's Green New Deal for housing. And then what happens when those become disrepaired when those fall into disrepair who will pay for it the taxpayers because there will be no security deposit that we can then use no they'll get free housing to fix up whatever is broken and there. we're paying for it now like we'll pay f we'll pay to build them and we'll, we'll pay to maintain them we'll pay to maintain them and then when they fall into disrepair yeah we'll I, we'll move them to an, a nicer newer spot okay so this is the united states of america right now the great replacement plan is unfolding let us know your thoughts on this in the comments below. We've got more news to get to. We're going to look at the bridge collapse and big updates from the NTSB. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, where is the king? You know, we've been talking about Kate Middleton, but where in the world is the king? He's going to release an audio message for Easter. Uh, there's something really weird going on, and uh, we're going to try to get to the bottom of it tonight. We're also going to look at Kosovo. Could be the new Ukraine. Uh, that is not making Serbians very happy today. But first... First, we want to tell you about our friends over at 1775 Coffee because you should never settle for crappy coffee. On a 1 to 10 scale, how much do you hate crappy coffee? Well, in 70, 1775, the world awakened to a new era, and now 1775 Coffee is bringing you a coffee that embodies the revolutionary spirit. It's crafted with passion and precision. Their beans are ethically and exclusively sourced from the finest coffee farms of Bolivia. 1775's Coffee Farm is a farm-to-cup journey ensures the highest quality authenticity and sustainability from start to finish with each sip your palate will recognize and appreciate the dedication and passion that goes into crafting this single sourced brew so order 1775 coffee check it out get it delivered to your house you can use the code redacted for 10 percent off at checkout on your first order it's brewed to perfection and crafted with revolution so again check them out at 17 75coffee.com slash redacted. Once again, our code is redacted and the website 1775coffee.com slash redacted. Do not have wimpy coffee. You're not a wimp. You want to start your day off strong. So try them 1775 coffee. Well, we are not wimps and we're not taking what the Biden administration is telling us about this bridge collapse on on face value. They are known liars. They lie for a living. So I've been heartened to see that it seems like about 80 percent, maybe even 90 percent of you were like, yeah, something is absolutely fishy with this. This doesn't make sense. Things are not adding up. And then there's about 10 percent of you that are like, no, I believe the Biden administration. I believe what they're telling us is true, that this is probably misinformation. OK. You do you however you want to go about it. Well, we now have the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, um, has released its initial black box assessment of the cargo ship collision in Baltimore. So, Philip, you can roll this. This is their video that they released on board the ship where they're going to see this is their ship that pulled up alongside. They've got their drones out and they've been doing their initial assessments. Turns out that during the power outage, the black box didn't record a bunch of key information. Yes, the black box somehow didn't manage to record vital info. That's not supposed to happen. Even with the power off, it should independently operate. So keep rolling this if you would, Philip. I'll just read some of what the NTSB found here, but you can see the initial crash and those cargo containers right now, which have breached 
We'll get to that in a second. So at about 30, uh, 0.39 hours on Tuesday morning, the box ship Dolly got underway from Baltimore's secret terminal with 21 Indian crew members, two local pilots, 56 hazmat containers on board. The pilots released the docking tugs shortly after, and the vessel was on its way into the open channel. Then at about 1 morning, 1, one hour, 24, 0, I don't know how you say that in military times, like 0, 1.24 a.m. Dolly was underway in the channel, making eight knots and steering 141 degrees. Then at about 1.25 a.m., multiple alarms went off. And the video, the VDR, which is the black box, ceased recording. It just stopped. So the black box just stopped recording anything at 1.25 a.m., according to the NTSB. Using backup power... The, the black box kept recording bridge audio only. That's it. Nothing else. One minute later, 1.26 a.m., the black box was able to resume recording the ship's electronic data. Okay. Shortly after that, at 1.26, the pilot made a general VHF call for tug assistance. So we have basically two minutes of the black box not recording anything. The vital two minutes. Strange. That's, so, uh, that's, isn't that what the black box is supposed to do? I yes. mean, that's, <laughs> yes. it just seems, that's just. Like, that's the whole point if, of the black if, box. If there is, yeah, if there's nothing nefarious going on, then this is like the most unfortunate, like, you know, like, like circumstance to, to that, that like in the, in the, the most critical moment, the black box just happens to stop recording. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, it's like the well, Epstein we, uh, uh, security camera. Yes. Right, they, you know? oh, right like yes. that. Exactly. Or right, the 17 Can minutes missing from of, Nixon's White House, uh, uh, you know, White House uh, during, for Watergate. Go ahead, David. Exactly. Can we think of another time that the black boxes didn't work? The other, only other time in history that we've ever heard that they'd have it worked when that was? Um... Uh, I think it happened in some September, in the month of September or something. Yeah, I mean, it was on September 11th. That's mm -hmm. so strange. Yeah, it's it's it. very strange when these things just, like, stop working like that. Um, so, yeah, it could be a total coincidence. How many of you, show of hands, think it's a coincidence? Yes or no? Uh, we don't believe in coincidences here on the show. So, you again, you do you. You know, if you believe the Biden administration, you do you. So, use back, backup power. Then it kept recording a little bit longer. It kept, and then it recorded some of the pilot's verbal rudder commands. One minute later, 126, the VDR was able to resume, and it got some of that electronic data. So again, for two minutes, gone. Here's the NTSB talking about, now, I want you to bear in mind, President Biden came out days ago and told us, first thing in the morning, that there's nothing to see here. Our, you know, initial investigation, no foul play, nothing to worry about. We're going to rebuild the port and we're going to re we're going to pay for everything. We're going to fix the bridge. Don't worry about it. Let's move along. I got to get catch a flight to North Carolina. Two days later, the NTSB now admits that they just arrived on board to start their initial investigation. So how did the Biden administration get this data when they hadn't even landed on the ship yet? Watch. The operations and engineering uh, group was able to board the vessel last night and they did a walkthrough of the vessel including the bridge and the engine room uh, they were looking for other electronic uh, components any sort of downloadable recorders any sort of cameras any sort of cctv uh, they did not find any of those things uh, but uh, that search continues oh we're just we're looking around like anything here recording anything at any time. No, yeah, we don't have any huh. recording They're equipment. Magically off again. They're what all that? gone. We can't find anything. That's so weird. There's no recording equipment. And as one viewer wrote me this afternoon to say, hey, Clayton, why was there only like one CTTV camera in that whole port? Like, why are we only seeing footage from like one location? That one CTV, uh, CCTV camera. Good question. So we don't know. So let's go to um, the frame four here. Yeah, that one there, Philip. So at this time, a dispatcher at the Pilots Association contacted the duty officer and let them know that, oh my God, you better shut down some traffic here. At 1.27 a.m., two minutes before contact with the bridge pier, the pilot gave the order to drop Dolly's port anchor. He also gave additional steering commands. At, so now we have power resuming, but we heard that there was no power before this. 
At 1.27, the pilot made a general radio call over VHF to warn that the Dolly had lost all power and was approaching the bridge. So this would have been verbal steering commands. So why did it suddenly turn with such a sharp turn into the pier or into the, uh, the, into the pylon of the bridge? The ship was making seven knots at 1.29 a.m., the moment that the, the, the black box began recording the audible sounds of the collision. The noise continued until 1.29, and the pilot made a VHF call to report the bridge, bridge's collapse a few minutes later. Okay. So now the NTSB admits that they just began interviewing crew members yesterday. Agency chair Jennifer Hommanday said at this press conference, the first interviews with the pilots are scheduled for tomorrow, meaning today, Thursday. For immediate term, the agency's focus is on collecting any of So why wait this many days to start interviewing the crew? Don't you find that odd? You can just wait that long to, for an investigation into the crew? What happened? The, an investigation that we've been given a foregone conclusion. Right. So the, the Biden administration told us nothing to see here, nothing wrong. We've already come to the conclusion. The NTSB hasn't even interviewed the crew and the pilots yet. And they just arrived on board to get their initial assessment and find no electronic recording equipment two days later. But the Biden administration told us everything's fine. Okay. So, that again... This is unbelievable. It has, such an, it has such an eerie similarity to East Palestine it, it, when the train thing happened. Remember, it was like so immediate. They knew everything, you know, and it's like they, they didn't even do an investigation, but they knew what it was. They knew all this stuff. It's, and, and we know that that was, you know. Yeah. I, so, I I, yeah, I don't either. Uh, so she says that the, some of the small, some of the containers on the bow have been breached including some hazmat containers. And some of this has now made it into the water, has been spotted in the water. The area is dangerous to access, and federal and local responders are aware of the damage. So hazardous, tons of hazardous materials, she says. Listen. Now, the cargo manifest, fest, we did bring in uh, one of NTSB's senior hazmat investigators today to begin to look at the cargo and the cargo manifest. Uh, he was able to identify 56 containers of hazardous materials. Uh, that's 764 tons of hazardous materials, mostly corrosives, flammables, uh, and some miscellaneous hazardous materials, class nine. Class nine hazardous materials. So just a lot of hazardous materials on the front of this ship that crashed into the bridge. Jeez. So, again, I want to play this for you in case you missed it last night. But Laura Logan, in the investigative journalist, says, you know, why is President Biden coming to the microphone telling his country that this is not terrorism when she's separately confirmed this with her own intelligence sources inside the Biden administration who are saying this was a cyber attack? This is Laura Logan, her reporting. Listen. And here's the other thing that's concerning me. Why they run to the mic? Had McCabe on this morning. On, on at sunrise on CNN uh -huh. saying it's not terrorism, it's not terrorism, it's uh -huh. not terrorism. It might not be terrorism, but why do you come to the mic right away? These are the type, we need facts, we need empirical evidence, we need an investigation. What What is your I, investigation telling you? Well, I have a better question for you, Steve. Why are you coming to the mic telling the country that it's not terrorism when your own intelligence uh, agencies are telling you it is? And I know they are, because I didn't make this up. These are not my words. Right. I'm talking to people who are on the inside, some who are on active duty, some who are retired. And everyone, literally, from critical infrastructure in Department of Homeland Security to the intelligence agencies, they know there's no other. It, it's there. This is a cyber attack on a critical infrastructure corridor for the United States. This is, you know, for those people who think this is just a river, this is in Baltimore, what does this matter? You don't know anything about what you're talking about. This, the I-94 corridor on the eastern seaboard is literally what connects the north and south. And when I talk about hazardous materials, right, this is a brilliant, well-planned strategic attack on one of the most important supply chains in the United States of America. So do you still believe the Biden administration on this? Love to hear from you in the comments below, but that's the big update from the NTSB, the missing two minutes of recorded information Come on the black box on. and the fact that you didn't even arrive for two days later, start your initial assessment and look for recording equipment and electronic surveillance equipment and it's all gone, it's, there's nothing there. Well, there's hazardous material, they didn't wanna go there.
Yeah, of course not. Right? Send Kramer out swimming in the river. <laughs> right. No, in the Hudson. Yeah, I'm swimming in there. K Kramer, you smell. You shouldn't be swimming in there. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. It's a good episode. All right, we've got more news to get to. We're going to talk about Made in Canada in a moment because a huge win for the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab's eugenics plan in Canada and the big update on the Made program there will take you to Canada in a moment. Plus, where is the king? The Easter message is being delivered today, but it's being delivered without video and on audio pre-recorded by the king. Where is the king? We're going to get to the bottom of that today. But first, I'm going to tell you right now what's going on with the recession heading our way. Layoffs already happening. Government printing more money. The, the Fed's throwing up their hand. The Fed, the Fed last week throwing up its hand saying, we're done. We're not fighting inflation anymore. So we're admitting we're going to just slash interest rates and inflation's going to run hot for some time. Then you, of course, that's why you saw gold prices surge because everyone's running into gold right now. They want something stable. They want real estate. They want silver. They want gold, just like I do. I do not want to have my family's future tied to the U.S. dollar. Our friends at Lear Capital can actually help you get set up and start investing in gold, precious metals, and have it shipped right to your house. You can get gold coins. You can get silver coins. All of that shipped right to your house. You can keep it in your gun safe if you want, or you can have it stored off-site at a secure facility. Totally up to you. One of the benefits about having it stored off-site is that if you need to convert it to cash for some reason to make a purchase of anything, you can do that usually within like two to three days. It can happen like that pretty quickly. Again, but you you do you. Um, and our friends at Lear can help you do this. We are big proponents of them. They have thousands of five-star reviews. Many of our audience, many of you guys are Lear um, Lear customers. And so they are they are a patriotic company. They're located in the United States. They're fantastic. Anyway, you can call their 800 number. Get on the phone with them. Just have a conversation with them. Go to 1-800-613-3557. Get your free gold and silver guide right now. They'll send it to you and you can decide. You can just sit down and you don't have to do anything. You just talk to them, get your free guide, talk it over with your family members. Say, hey, we've got $1,000 sitting in U.S. dollars in cash in our savings account right now. Maybe we want to, we want to convert that to precious metals because it's sustained for 5,000 years and who knows where the U.S. dollar is going. Call their 800 number, 1-800-613-3557 or go to the website learredacted.com. That's learredacted.com. Well, we've been following the Medical Assistance in Dying Act in Canada, which of course allows the state to provide assisted suicides to its citizens in Canada. And Canada, of course, leads the world on this. And one big case caught our attention last week when we learned of a father trying to get the state to stop putting his daughter, his 27-year-old daughter, yes, she's an adult, into the MAID program uh, due to autism. And the father has been pleading with the province to stop this from happening. Well, we have a big update on this story now, and we wanted to bring in David Creighton from Ottawa to talk about the very latest on this, independent journalist uh, who also writes over the Post Millennial and has a great YouTube channel as well. David, great to see you. So I guess a big update on this story. Well, we had a, a ruling yesterday from the justice in Calgary, Justice Feesby, who has lifted an injunction that the father of this woman had placed upon her in an attempt just to delay things so that he would at least find out why his daughter, who goes in the news by MV, there's a publication ban on this. The father is known as WV, collectively with his wife. He wants to know why his autistic daughter, who apparently might also suffer from uh, attention deficit disorder is eligible for medical assistance in dying canada's odious euthanasia program he wants some answers because as far as he's concerned his daughter shouldn't be seeking mate and he wants to know why so but yesterday a judge lifted the injunction now he has stayed the ruling for 30 days in the event that there's an appeal from the father but I found the judge's words and his description of why he lifted this injunction to be especially chilling because he said it would cause irreparable harm for this woman if she was not allowed to proceed with euthanasia, state-assisted euthanasia. Now that to me goes to my very soul. 
and I say, have we come this far in Canada where it's somehow irreparably harmful if people aren't allowed to commit suicide with the state's assistance? Well, in re it well it's absolutely shocking. And it opens up, of course, a new pre a, a level of precedence that I'm worried would would you know open up a can of worms across across Canada for other cases in this regard. Um, and of course, she is 27 years old, so she is an adult. But what if it's a child who is under the age of 18 um, and a parent, a child has ADHD, it has autism, and the state uh, allows this child to go forward with being added to the MAID program? Uh, and I know people sitting back saying that there's no way that that could happen. Well, just look what's happening in California, for instance, right? When families, of course, have torn apart or trying to keep their children from getting, uh, uh, you know, um, gender, gender reassignment surgeries. But the state will side with the children and the parents have no say about it. So before you go and say this could never happen, it is happening. And I wouldn't be surprised that the very same thing could set a precedent in Canada, no? Well, that's precisely what is happening, Clayton, there tremendous agitation right now from groups who not only want the mentally ill included, but want children included. Mm. And these children are so-called minors who think like adults. That's the only way I can describe the euphemism that they put on it. They tag to this. These are minors who somehow should be treated as adults because they think like adults. It's somebody says they're capable of thinking like adults. This, of course, is just in tune with what you just described with gender reassignment, sex change surgery. 12 year olds who think they're adults and say, I'd like a sex change, please. Well, thankfully, the tide is turning against that slowly in Canada, slowly. province by province. But I want to see provinces intervene in this damned odious euthanasia program in Canada. Medical doings, the, the entire medical establishment, health care is a provincial jurisdiction. So why aren't the provinces fighting back on Trudeau's euthanasia program? And very ominously, yesterday, the health minister, who is the euthanasia, euthanasia czar in this country, Mark Holland, a liberal MP from Ajax, Ontario, who has been in the, around for quite a while, doing no good, announced that even though the federal government would not immediately or this year include mentally ill patients as part of the MAID program, he said it was inevitable that it was going to happen. They just needed to slow down a bit. Guess why they need to slow down? Because there's too many independent journalists saying, what's going on here? And there's too many Canadians who are saying, why is Canada expanding this horrible euthanasia program? Because who's next? And it is absolutely shocking to me that once again, we have people in the judicial arena suggesting that there's anything good about assisted suicide. This, this should not be some kind of medical health care option. But increasingly, as we reported here on Redacted in the past, euthanasia is being seen as a health care option. Can't get cancer care? Can't get your cancer removed? Well, there's always made. And this is where this program is progressing. It's progressing into eugenics as well, because the mentally ill will include a category that is going to be broader and broader. Alcoholics, well, you may, you may not think you're an alcoholic. Well, maybe somebody will make that decision for you. Right. Drug addicts, even people who, how about people who induce self-harm? Are they mentally ill? These are usually sometimes conditions that people can overcome through work, right. through dedication. And we should not be foisting suicide, assisted suicide on them as a primary option. This is the mark of a country that is going into the, a new dark age. Well, you said it. It is eugenics, and I don't even think it's coming back. It's it's here. It never went away, the eugenics program. And I think this is exactly an extension of what the World Economic Forum wants. This has been a program that's been in place since you know the early part of the 1900s. 
and it's just metastasized into something we now call medical assistance in dying. We call transhumanism uh, through these drugs and puberty blockers and these surgeries, and now with euthanasia, and of course going after the mentally ill. This is exactly what the eugenics program was all about. So this is just, it's, it's got a new modern veneer on it, uh, but it's no different than what we saw uh, in the, you know, the 1930s, 1940s in the United States and beyond. So where do you think things go with this case next? Now, again, I come back to the point that, and as viewers have reminded us, well, how can they, you know, because she's 27 years old, it's his daughter. I mean, I hope I, I never stop defending my daughter when she just, when she turns 18. You know, I hope I will try to find the best options for my daughter, you know, as long as I live. Forget the fact that she's 27 doesn't really matter. But because she's an adult, uh, you know, where does this go from here, do you suppose? I think at the very least, what the father deserves to know is why his daughter is making this selection, making this choice. And up to now, he's been denied that. I, I think that's outrageous. He should at least have the knowledge of what is going on here. I'm not optimistic that any appeal will be successful because there appears to be a distinct bias in the judiciary against stopping people from committing suicide. What I'm optimistic about, uh, Clayton, is what I heard on the weekend. I was at a Axe the Tax rally here in Ottawa with Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader. And he has said in the past that he will not expand made one inch more. And I do believe he is open to repealing this program. But he described a Canada in this speech the other day that for me was reminiscent of a 1984 Ronald Reagan campaign commercial called It's Morning Again in America. And Pierre Polyev described a Canada that I would say it's morning again in Canada, where people get up in the morning and are happy to go to work because their taxes will not be going towards programs like this. They will not be confronted constantly with nonsense about gender ideology and climate change. They will not be confronted constantly with distractions, but they'll be happy to raise their families, to provide for their families, and to be proud to be Canadian again. And that is something Justin Trudeau, because he works for the WEF, he works for the globalist agenda. That's something Justin Trudeau has not advanced. He's not working for Canada. And that's why he supports programs like euthanasia, because it's killing Canadians and it's killing Canada. But I'm optimistic if we can get rid of this clown within the next year and a half, there's a brighter future ahead. Well, we got equal clowns. And I wouldn't trade I wouldn't trade your clown for my clown in the United States one bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, man, we it's a clown show right now is what it is. I hope from your mouth to God's ears we can get rid of these clowns. Um, and just as a side note here, I mean, Canadians are just being crushed by the price of food, the, 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 the crushing costs of uh, through inflation and the, the, the crushing costs of rents and mortgages, the property taxes, uh, property values, the cost of properties. In fact, a friend of mine in Vancouver yesterday just sent me a photo of a house down the street from him that just sold. It's a two-bedroom, two-bath, and it was built in the 1950s. It just sold for $1.6 million. Two-bedroom, two-bath. Uh, how in the world is a young Canadian supposed to you know, buy a home, provide for their family, when you're looking at exorbitant costs? And I saw another viral video out of Canada the other day at a woman in a, one of, a, I think it was a Costco, and she was just showing the price of all of the groceries and the meat. One thing of meat was over $120 Canadian. Um, I, ju I just couldn't believe it. Um, and so does Pierre Polyev have a plan for this runaway prices in that country as well? Well, he, he mentioned an anecdote on Sunday, which I found very interesting. He was talking to a, a young man who was doing the same job as his father had done years earlier, the same job. And... He was unable to buy the same house that his mother and father were wow. living in, the same That's kind of house, because it was just impossible to wow. do so. And you're looking at $2,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. Rent!
in cities like Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary. I mean, I don't know how I would even afford that. <laughs> and and it, it is absolutely ridiculous to expect people. And Polyev is, is saying we are spending money like water on the wrong things in this country. Let's get rid of these regulations. Let's have people build apartment buildings and houses without red tape and regulations on them. Canada is a country with a population of not quite 40 million people. It's the second largest country in the world. Why are we paying exorbitant prices for food when we have cattle ranging in Alberta and across the Western prairies? It is absolutely ridiculous. You would think there's an agenda here coming from the WEF. And that agenda is to starve Canada, to freeze Canada, to make fuel impossible to obtain or to buy, and to make food incredibly expensive to produce and to purchase. And that is where Justin Trudeau is going. He's not here to make Canada great. He's not here to help Canadians. He's here because he's working for Klaus Schwab. And I see that increasingly evident. And this is why Klaus Schwab loves Justin Trudeau so much. Right, and he said it publicly multiple times. He's a great protege. Oh boy, well. Let's hope that we can end this clown show. I, I'm growing increasingly despondent in our two countries right now. David Creighton, great to see you up there in Canada. Thank you so much for speaking the truth and, uh, and keeping us aware of what's going on because the mainstream media certainly will not. Thanks, David. Thank you so much, Clayton. Unbelievable. Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Yep. So Klaus Schwab is absolutely winning in Canada. Um, we've got more news to get to. Let's talk about the king. Well, King Charles released a pre-recorded audio only message for Easter today. Pre-recorded audio, you say. They sure are giving us a lot of reasons to suspect them lately, are they not? Here is an image we got of the king releasing this message. So he's in front of a voice recorder. He's smiling. We have a still image. We have audio. We have this transcript. So we totally believe it, right? Here's a transcript of the King's message. This was for uh, what's called Maundy Thursday. Here is the King's message being broadcast in the church where he would have otherwise attended. Uh, and it's being broadcast to church and churchgoers. Who be chosen today to receive the Maundy money from my wife are wonderful examples of such kindness of going way beyond the call of duty and of giving so much of their lives to the service of others in their communities. This act of worship here in Worcester Cathedral reminds me of the pledge I made at the beginning of the coronation service to follow Christ's example, not to be served, but to serve. Okay. That I have always tried to wow, so it's like the 1930s. Like Exactly yeah, right. It's, it's like, like World the, War the II. king on the radio. Like we're going to get, hey, we're all gathering around the wireless tonight, and we're going to sit and listen to the king's message tonight. Right. I was, I was just going to say, I've seen, I've seen this movie. <laughs> right. I've seen yeah. this movie, and, and it's, <laughs> yeah. the, the reason you don't see him is because he has a speech impediment, right? Oh, right. Right. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. While Hitler's yeah, forces are moving across the eastern flank, we want to hear from the king tonight. Let's gather around the wireless, and let's listen to the king. That's exactly what this is, the king's speech. Yeah. David, were you going to say something? Oh, I, I just said I saw this King's speech and it was actually a really good movie. But right. it reminded me of too. But it does feel like a movie where we're being asked to buy into some kind of ruse, doesn't it? So we've been now following the inconsistencies around Princess Kate and whether or not they're lying about her whereabouts. There are various images that we've been given of her in the last few weeks that do nothing to make us feel better about the truth. So here are the three images we've had of the princess in the last three weeks. The one on the bottom in the car, we were told, was her first appearance post-surgery. The one on the bottom right, it was supposedly her at a farm shop walking next to William. And then the one in the center was from a video that the BBC edited and filmed of her announcing that she has been dealing with cancer. Now, the image from the BBC doesn't really help with credibility because the BBC reportedly shot this, but they're being cagey about how, why we can't even know the people who were involved in it 
based on freedom of information requests, and they refused to answer questions on who worked on that video announcement. So now the BBC is giving us this pre-recorded King's message and an image. It just feels like in the year 2024, when we're used to having video footage of everything, we really are getting strange information and disparate images out of the palace. So now we're being asked to believe that the king is too sick to appear at this important religious service, but he is okay because we have this audio recording and the palace says he's determined to attend Easter church on Sunday. Here is last year, Maundy Thursday, where the king and queen both showed up. They give out coins to the poor. That's sort of the tradition. And then this year, king Queen Camilla had to go it alone. Here is images we have of her this morning. Now, royal correspondent Michael Cole was on GB News today. He said the king is under great strain and that this image shows us that he's really not in good shape. A photograph has been officially give, uh, issued of the king at his desk. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there it is. Uh, he's not obviously not fuller in the face. The, the effect of the chemotherapy, I think, is there. Um, his lips look thinner, and obviously it's a great strain for anybody, uh, but while you're bearing the burdens of uh, being head of state at the same time as you're being treated, I'm sure it isn't easy for him. Uh, it's a very great shame for me to see him. I was five years old when he was born. I've watched him and reported on him throughout his life, and I'm very sad to see him in this, uh, in this way. But um, Queen Camilla will be there today and she will be doing the honors and distributing to worthy local people these lovely little purses containing uh, the silver coins. Mm. We're not going to see the king today, but we are hoping to see him on Sunday, aren't we, Michael, uh, in Windsor yep. on Easter Sunday. And that will be very heartening for people who are, who are concerned and worried about his majesty. Yes, I think that's right. He's determined to be there as best he can uh, with as many members of his uh, family as possible in attendance. All right, as many as possible. So now we're taking bets on who we'll actually get to see. They could totally bring it. They could totally blow us all up with this. And there's, there's the king. And there's, there's Kate. There's Kate. There's everyone's there. Everyone's happy and no more. No more. I mean, of this. I will feel a whole lot better if I see William's children who have been missing yeah. in all of this. Right. Never visited in the hospital. We have not seen images of them yet. Uh, they, they say the king is really determined to make it on Easter Sunday. So will we actually see the king in a convincing way? Um, but the palace is question. Yeah. Are, th are thin lips, he says his lips look thinner, like is that an indication of unhealth, like not being healthy? I've never well, heard that before. A lot of people who have chemotherapy, they need to like have popsicles or ice, ice because they get really dry and chapped in the mouth and painful mm -hmm. mouth sores. So that is an indication of somebody going through chemotherapy. Okay. Yeah. I just um, thought that was an odd. <laughs> right. And we haven't seen the king much since about two weeks ago when the Daily Mail reported that he was seen leaving Windsor Castle. They said that Russia had started rumors about the king's disappearance and also about Kate Middleton. But we got this image of him leaving in a car. Now, we reported this last week that Russia really had nothing to do with this and the reporting that was saying that possibly he was dead when on St. Patrick's Day it was trending that the king had died. That was not started by Russia. That came out of a Pakistani outlet based on a TikTok video run by two American ladies. So here are those ladies. It had nothing to do with Russia or misinformation. Uh, well, it wasn't. Well, I don't know now. I don't want to say it was not misinformation. We literally don't know. Right. We can't say. And when we are told that it is foreign interference, why would Russia care? I don't know. Right. We're, and now the press in Britain is saying that, oh, it's not just Russia. It's also Iran and China. They're all working together to spread lies about the king and Kate Middleton and that Elon Musk should shut that down. Here's a report from Good Morning Britain. They offer no proof. They just say, we think this is probably happening. So if you're worried about the king and the princess, that's foreign psyop. Don't do that. Don't and, worry about them. And here is them. Like, look, look how little proof they have in this report. It's shocking. It's being suggested. He doesn't say by who. He has no proof at all. That's like no report at all. He just said, we're suggesting it. He has no proof of that. Well, he did and say, he's, He did ahead. say in the past this has happened. 
So, I mean, that obviously, if something has happened in the past, it must be true right now, correct? I, I mean, but what? What I mean, is he that, referring to? That yeah. Iran well, cares I mean, about a princess disappearing? <laughs> right? I, it's just, you know. He doesn't have that, to that offer his, any initial evidence. Yeah. yeah, that was his initial evidence was, well, in the past, we've seen this. Like, okay, great. What about right now? What about right now? Right. And uh, if you watch this whole report, he never, he, they have on experts that say, yeah, other countries, they do this sometimes. And it rises in social media. And Elon Musk should do something about it because well, social media, that's the report. He did, he did throw in the, yeah, he did throw in the lots of people believe. And that right there is about as much evidence as they have. There lots we go. Of people believe, you know, like the, the ad populi. Yeah. It's a load of bollocks. Uh, so all of this behavior is cagey, does not help the monarchy at all, uh, and definitely not their perception. Here's Camilla arriving at church today to chants of protesters chanting, down with the crown. It's hard to hear what they're saying, so, but what they are saying is down with the crown, down with the crown, um, because she is having to stand in for the king, probably. I mean, that's not the only reason. They always get chants like that of people who think the British monarchy does not well represent them and is not a good use of taxpayer dollars. So, again, we're taking bets on whether or not we'll see the king this Easter weekend, which members of the royal family, and again, maybe everything they're saying is true and they're just saying it in a terrible way that makes us suspicious. Uh, maybe the conspiracy theories are unfounded or maybe the royals are just weird and bad at telling the truth, but tell us what you think. Crazy stories. All right, let us know yeah, your thoughts on that. Um, hey, we have a story. If you'd like to support independent journalism, you can do that. Um, before we get to our next story on Kosovo and what's going on with Serbia right now, it's a big, big story. Head on over to our store and check this out. If you'd like to buy a hoodie or a t-shirt or a mug and support independent journalism, we are not we are not funded by Big Pharma or the military industrial complex or anybody. We are funded by you and the few sponsors that we have here on the show. So thank you guys so much for your support. You head on over there. You can pick up one of our I do not uh, I will not comply hoodies or t-shirts. Uh, friends don't let friends watch the mainstream media. Plus we've got our farmers, uh, no no farmers no food shirts as well. Uh, again, redactedstore.com is the place to go, redactedstore.com. The European Council is recommending adding Kosovo to its ranks, and Serbia is not happy about this. Joining us to discuss today is Nick Stankovic. He is a Serbian and an expert in Asian and Serbian politics. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure. It's my pleasure. So what has happened today is that the European Commission is reaching into Kosovo. Serbia is not happy about this. Can we say that this is another conflict that's boiling, perhaps instigated by the West? Can you give us a little bit of a history on what this means? Well, I think most people remember that there was a uh, NATO intervention in, in Kosovo in Serbia, or in, then known as Yugoslavia, Serbian Montenegro about Kosovo. So Kosovo uh, was uh, quote unquote liberated by NATO and NATO moved in to sort of have a peace agreement. Uh, and at some point in 2008, they actually declared independence, which Serbia doesn't recognize. A lot of the Western countries recognize, but for example, China, India, Russia do not recognize. So um, that's kind of where we are. Since then, there has been many uh, steps to make, uh, to sort of make what they called to make life of the people in the Balkans, in Serbia and in Kosovo, and that's true, to make it more uh, normal. And, and there was a, a, several steps that Serbia agreed to, for example, to recognize diplomas and license plates. And it was kind of very, it was very painful for Serbia to do that step by step in part because each step essentially was a mini recognition of Kosovo's independence, which Serbia has said it will never do. So um, what has happened, what has happened um, 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 yesterday, it's the, uh, the it's, sort of, it's just the next step. So now the, it's now it's now it's the European Council that's going to recognize or accept Kosovo into its membership, uh, which is something that obviously, again, is, is something that Serbia is not happy, as you mentioned. Well, earlier this week, Kosovo President Alvin Kurti 
which we've called a couple of times, or not, it's not my words, but Vucic, the, pr the prime minister of Serbia, has said that he's a wannabe Zelensky. And he continues to up the rhetoric on X, saying that Serbia is on the verge of attacking Kosovo. Is this rhetoric or is it true? Well, I think... Um... I think it's well, I think it's mostly rhetoric, but it's true that Kurti has been pushing uh, very aggressively to for some of these steps and to sort of uh, breaking some of the making some unilateral actions that even the United States was not happy. There were several and, and also the European Union. They were not happy because he's pushing for it and he's making some of these steps which really ag aggravate Serbia. And in some cases, and we've if people remember, I think last year. Uh, Vucic even ordered Serbian military to the border, which everybody knew nothing was going to happen. But it's it's kind of tense, right? It's very tense. Now, for that in particular uh, comment by Vucic, I think it's sort of in jest. However, there is a connection between uh, what has happened, what is happening in Kosovo, and what is happening in Ukraine. Of course, Russia is supporting Serbia by uh, essentially also blocking. Kosovo's membership in the UN, you know, they've never actually attempted it because Russia has said we'll put a veto in uh, and so it wouldn't happen. But also because some of the, actually the situation is not that, there's some similarities between the two situations. And of course, a lot of people in, um, in Europe consider Serbia and there's even, you know, they've, they've used this as well as little Russia, you know, it's where Serb, Serbs are like the little Russia in the Balkans and also, you know, in Kahoot. So it's a little bit of, there's a jest on both sides, I think. Uh, but there's some there's some truth to it. And, you know, both sides, are, and I think what Kurti's trying to do is he's trying to sort of escalate his problem or his situation into the spotlight of whatever's happening. Because most of the focus, obviously, in Europe now is in Ukraine and Russia and all that. And Kurti's like, me too, me too, we're there too. It's the same thing, you know. We're, right. So that's kind of what's what that is all about. Well, I guess as a Westerner, my taxes are going to drag out a war in Ukraine under this rhetoric that Ukraine is a hopeful and on the up and up democracy, which I reject. So I guess I'm asking, maybe a little bit self-referencing, but are they going to start selling me Kosovo as a beacon of hope Again? that we need to liberate from but that's either already Russia happened. or but that is a okay. That's that happening happened. in front of our well, eyes is what you're saying. Well, well, actually, that has happened in 99, right? So this is, you know, that's kind of almost what they're trying to do is actually close that story. Part of the reason why they're trying to close the story of Kosovo, which close for them means essentially uh, Kosovo becoming uh, a member of the UN. I think that's sort of the, 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 the end game. And they want to close that story in part before anything happens in Ukraine or the end of the conflict in Ukraine, which... It's probably not going to happen very soon, but they they would certainly like to close Kosovo because the two situations are somewhat related and solution for one may actually affect the solution for another one. So, for example, if Kosovo is ad admitted to the UN, uh, then, you know, maybe what Russia is doing is going to be, uh, you know, uh, the, the adoption of Donbass, for example, into Russia and all these new regions, Russia could claim the same thing. Um, but so, so that's, there's actually a plan, and this is something that I mentioned to you. There's actually a plan called a, a, a Franco-German plan, which is kind of being hush-hush, and it's, we're not even sort of allowed to talk about it. Well, not really, but I mean, it, it's not even brought to like the Serbian parliament. It's, no, it's not being discussed. And even Vucic is kind of not, you know, sort of allowed to talk about it. And, and, and the plan basically says, because Serbia said, we're not going to recognize Kosovo, right, ever. And... Um, and Russia has said, as long as Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo, we'll put a veto in the UN. So that's never happening, right? And also China said the same thing because they basically said, whatever Serbia agrees to, if Serbia agrees to it, well, you know, that, then that's their thing. But but if they don't agree to it, we'll just veto it. So what they're trying to do now with this Franco-German plan is to make sure that the plan says Serbia will not object, okay? So it's not, it, it's not like Serbia has to recognize Kosovo but Serbia will not object to Kosovo uh, becoming members, member of international organizations, mainly the UN. And so um, they brought this to Vucic, they gave it to him, 
And of course, you know, when people, so it was almost secret, like nobody knew what, what it said. And so Wojcic came back from this meeting and everybody was like, what happened? Did you sign anything? What does it say? And, and then he said what it says. And they said, well, did you sign it? Did you accept it? And he said, I, I did not reject it. Because the plan also says, if Serbia rejects it, there will be serious consequences. So nobody knows what that is, of course. And, you know, Serbia has been bombed already. So everybody was like, you know, but so Vucic, you know, he doesn't want to reject it because that then the serious conflict, which probably means sanctions and things like that. But so he said, I'm not, I didn't reject it. Well, did you accept it? I didn't reject it. Um, oh, and, okay. and then they asked him, they asked him if he signed anything and he said he didn't sign anything. And so a lot of the Serbian opposition, for example, in Serbia is saying, well, we need to discuss this at the point. We have to have a vote. We have to have a referendum. If we're going to accept this plan, then we need to have a vote. But that's not the, apparently what, you know, France and Germany would allow. And Vucic is sort of, you know, he can't really talk about it, but he cannot reject it because rejecting it would be bad. Con so anyway, it's a very, uh, so that's actually, I think at the, that's the most serious thing happening right now. This thing with the Council of Europe is uncomfortable. It's just another step. But I think um, um, the Franco-German plan is really, uh, really the scary part. Yes. I was reading a book this week called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Have you ever heard of this book? Oh, I read that. Oh, I read it a long time ago. Yes. Okay. So a lot of times it's in the book, it says that when the West presents a country with a plan that will benefit the West and a leader pushes back, what happens is the jackals come in, which are CIA backed coups. So this reads to me like a possibility, but I don't know what consequences he's being threatened with. Right. Well, obviously he cannot talk about it openly and, and he cannot share some of the personal conversations. Although I think Vucic, uh, you know, he's been in power for 12 years and he has been a very cooperative, including on Kosovo and some other issues as well with the European Union and the United States. He actually has a very good, a decent relationship with the Biden administration and has a very good relationship or had a very good relationship with the Trump administration. So he is, um, he's not the bad boy, really, like, for example, you know, maybe Lukashenko or somebody like that. So he has been very cooperative, for which he has been criticized as well in Serbia. But I don't think they're going to coup him. Um, so as long as he cooperates. So, so some people in Serbia, so this is what's happening internally in Serbia, is, is some people are saying, not necessarily... Are, you know, they're saying he's under pressure and he's going to sign something because he's under pressure, but we don't we won't know what it is. Yeah. And he's going to sign it maybe in the best of intentions, you know, to prevent something bad. That, that, but so, so so a lot of people in Serbia say we need to know what is going on. We need to hear it. We need to vote, discuss it. We need to vote on it. And he is not doing it in part probably because they told him, you know, don't make it really public. And so that's where we are. It's very murky and it's very, and then once in a while, you know, he comes out with these messages like two days ago that says, you know, situation is very serious. You know, we've been, you know, given some ultimatums and this and that. Everybody's like, well, you know, what is going on? So. Right. But uh, he spoke to the United speech. Nations in 2022 and said, it's better to go to peace talks to 100, for 100 years than wage war for even one day. And that's a paraphrase. Uh, so now right. we'll see if he, you know, actually does this. It, it, it doesn't seem. And, and so what you're saying is that these are boiling contradictions, boiling conflicts. Right. But it doesn't seem like a full on war is going to happen. And we are talking right. this week on the 25 year anniversary of when NATO started illegally bombing Serbia. Right. So that also may be why tensions are so hot. Right. Right. And and also. So that uh, bombing of, of Yugoslavia or Serbia was definitely legal because there was no UN approval, which is also interesting because, of course, you know, there was no UN approval for Russia's mili uh, military action. So um, that's also kind of related. And also NATO is involved in both conflicts, including the one in Ukraine, obviously, even though they say we're not part of it. But of course, we know they are. So there's a lot of things going on. And I think tensions are high um, in part because of Ukraine as well. And, um, you know, I, there's nothing imminent. There's nothing imminent in terms of, of any, any war or anything. But, you know, with tensions being so high and also uh, the, the Kosovo prime minister, I think he's not being very constructive. And that's even being recognized by the European Union and the U.S. You know, because the European Union and the U.S. also don't want another, you know, another conflict, you know, starting in Europe. 
I mean, they, they, they have their hands full with. So it's a, there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, we hope for the best, everybody, you know, that, that there's really, and I think what you see is right. I think it's always better to negotiate, um, you know, as he said, for a hundred years, than then, then, you know, just go to war. As we can see in Ukraine, it's just so horrible. But the people in Ukraine voted and asked Russia to come in and protect them from the Ukrainian army. What is the will of the people of Kosovo? Oh, I think, well, Kosovo is much more um, uh, ethnically, uh, you know, there's, there's, Kosovars are now probably 90, 90% or 90, I forget, but um, they're obviously a, a very large majority of Kosovo. So I think that um, they would almost certainly vote for independence. But here's the, here's the interesting thing is they never had a referendum in Kosovo. So they never had a referendum in Kosovo about independence, which the UN resolution was supposed to uh, provide for. And so they never voted. It was the parliament who just sort of declared independence as we're now an independent state, but there was never a referendum, which I would assume that Kosovo would, that they would win that referendum, but they never had it. They never, like in Russia, they actually held it, right? They, yes. they, they had a referendum in, in some of these, but they never had one in Kosovo. They just declared it and, you know, US and, and France and Germany and European Union, most of the countries in European Union uh, recognized it immediately. So that was that, it's, you know, and so that's another thing that obviously doesn't make um, uh, Serbs, Serbia happy and also Serbs in Kosovo because there's still Serbs in Kosovo, obviously. Right. Yeah. OK, well, this is amazing context. I really appreciate you breaking this down for us because it's not a simple thing. And again, you know, as Westerners, I think they understand that we don't we don't get it all that much. And so it always helps to study this. Uh, you can follow Nick at Nick Stankovic with an underscore on X. And I really appreciate your time coming on Redacted today. Thank you. Well, we appreciate that context because nobody wants to see new conflict in that region. So for sure. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for us on Redacted for the week. We will be back next week. We hope you have a great Easter, whatever it is you're going to do. And we will be back here next Monday, same time, same place. Also, incidentally, if you live in Europe, you might know that t clocks change this weekend. Clocks changed weeks ago in the United States. So we will be syncing back up on what is normally your redacted time is 9 p.m. Uh, London time. So if that's thrown you at all, we apologize. It always throws, throws us a little bit. Clayton, this is not an opportunity for you to rail again against daylight savings. Time. Daylight saving needs to be ended. Why no, the hell do we is, still I'm have daylight you're not saving? Doing that. Okay, we're going to go before Clayton launches into out. this diatribe Stop again. Stop daylight done. saving time. We're done time. now, honey. We're done. So